Welcome to the Miller Report. On the Miller Report, we usually talk to real estate people, developers, politicians, but today we're going to talk to somebody from the other side. I'm calling it the other side because it kind of is. He is the Director of Political Action of New York City Council of Carpenters. Basically, he is the political liaison for the Carpenters Union. We've all heard of that. So I want to welcome Kevin Elkins to the Miller Report. Thank, Thank you, so you much Kevin. For Sorry about the UN today, and I hope it wasn't too tough getting here. We're right in the middle of it. No, it's all right. We took the subway. Okay, good, good, good. So before we begin, I mean, most people in New York have heard of the Carpenters Union, but why don't you tell the audience what it is and what you do? Mm -hmm. Sure. So we represent over 20,000 uh, hardworking men and women in the unionized carpenter industry. Uh, that's not just people who are hanging drywall or some people just think wood. It involves everything from high rise concrete to dock builders. Uh, we do diving, we do whatever everything. We are the largest union uh, among the trades and we are on the project usually from start to finish. So our jurisdiction's wide, that's why we have so many members uh, and we uh, aggressively fight on their behalf, not just on their behalf, but also for those workers who don't have the benefit of having a union. Uh, we've seen such a rise in worker exploitation, whether it's wage theft or uh, people who are, are not able to know their rights or have their uh, benefits protected. And so we're not just fighting for our members, we're also fighting for those workers too. So you have 20,000 members. What does an average union employee get an hour? It depends on the trade, right? Uh, and it scales up for uh, apprentices up to journeymen. Um, we, uh, and, and it varies also. Well, give us the bottom trend. to top. Uh, it's, it could be in, in the low teens maybe or the high 20s when you're, when you're an apprentice. Uh, we offer a full four year uh, uh, paid apprenticeship program. So it's debt free. So you're working as you're learning. Uh, our, it's a very competitive program. We, we open it up. We have hundreds of people coming in every single day. That I would open. imagine today we probably need, with education being mm -hmm. lacked, you need skilled laborers. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, and our workers on statistically perform faster, do it, and do you it more efficiently. Yes, that's, we have a, a major, a state-of-the-art apprenticeship school, not only here in New York City, but in Las Vegas too. Is this the um, biggest union and most employees are in New York? Uh, not of any union, because uh, carpenters each of the carpenters. We are the only carpenter union in New York oh, City, wow. and we're made up of nine different district councils. Mm -hmm. That, like I said, they have mill rates, which, which handle turbines and nuclear energy plants and all that kind of stuff. To to people who are doing dock building, so we have divers, everything in between. Tell us what the role of organized labor, and to me that sounds a little fishy, but <laughs> tell us what, if you want to call it. That. Yes, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. What does organized labor? What do, what do they play in new development? Uh, well, we have a huge role in development, right? I think for a long time under the, uh, under Mayor de Blasio, there was sort of a, in our point of view, the developers had sort of the run of the city when it came to projects and making sure that there were fair worker standards on it because there weren't any. Um, and that was probably exemplified best by 421A, which based on our analysis, didn't result in many good paying jobs for, for most of those construction workers. And so when that program came up, for renewal, we among alone among all the trades said that program is not good for the people of New York City. It's not good for the renters. It's not good for the people who want to move here. And it's definitely not good for the people building it. So we said, we got to get rid of it. Um, no one, everyone doubted that we could do it, but we worked very hard. We formed a broad coalition and we eliminated the tax break. So I started this podcast by saying this is going to be from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So you and I are across the aisle, completely separate. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think that 421A was absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. It has was responsible for 70% of the rental mm -hmm. housing in New York between 2010 and 2020, mm -hmm. 70%. And you voted against it. Tell us why. Because the we believe firmly as a North Star is that if the construction workers who are building quote unquote affordable housing can't afford to work it, live in it, then it's not affordable. And time and time again, those workers were not making enough to have a family sustaining wage in New York City. So to us, you're right. It probably did result in most of those units. No, not probably. It did result in most of those units being constructed, but it was the only game in town. And just because something exists, it doesn't mean it's not broken. And so what we felt is let's, we first started off with, can we fix it? Grebney decided they didn't want to do that. I just have to interrupt mm -hmm. you. So you opposed it because the workers couldn't afford to live in those homes. Yeah. Even though, I mean, the affordable housing, right? And so 
um, based on there, there wasn't really a labor standard. So for us, we wanted to make sure that those workers, whether they're in a union or not, are going to be able to be protected. And so protecting your, your workers. Yeah. But when it expired, the governor Hochul proposed mm -hmm. an extension under the, a new name, 485W. Mm -hmm. You're still, your group still oppose that. Why? Well, if you go look at that legislation, it's most of what we proposed is actually included in that. Because but people, you opposed it. Not 485X. We killed 421A. The next year, they tried to bring it back. We said, not without strong labor standards. So it stayed dead. And this year, working with our allies in the legislature, uh, we created a, and, and the building trades with Gary LaBarbera, uh, our, the head of our union, Joseph Geiger, we created a proposal that we felt would help create, uh, build truly affordable housing, and those workers would be protected and can raise their family here in New York City. Rebney, the Real Estate Board of New York, did not want our proposal, but lo and behold, a few months later, after a lot of fighting and teeth left on the floor, who won? We did. What is in the new uh, proposed um, 485W? Mm -hmm. So there's, I think there's three big things, right? So first and foremost, there's strong enforcement. So if you are committing wage theft on- We'll get into wage theft. People don't yeah, know what that is, so. Sure, so wage theft means you're stealing the workers' uh, pay. You've typically seen this in the non-union residential sector where uh, especially uh, uh, undocumented immigrants or people who just don't know their rights or have the ability to know them through no fault of their own, um, they may get be owed two hundred dollars, but instead they're getting a hundred dollars. You may also have situations where someone Who's, who, uh, could you back up. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about wage theft sure. before we talk about. Four, we we mm -hmm. will come back to what what's in four eighty one, four eighty five. Sure. So wage theft. So I go, mm -hmm. I'm a union worker mm -hmm. and I'm supposed to get paid two hundred dollars. They're keeping a hundred dollars. Who's keeping it? Well. First and foremost, you're not really seeing wage theft among the unionized industry because we all have mechanisms in place to make sure our people are getting paid. So what is wage theft? So wage theft, right? And you see this not just in the construction industry, but you'll see it uh, in the restaurant industry and in any industry where mm -hmm. there's people primarily who are undocumented um, and the most vulnerable to exploitation. What happens is you work a certain amount of hours, right? You're entitled to a certain amount of money. The person paying you, whether it's a subcontractor, whether it's a labor broker, whether it's your immediate boss, instead of giving you what you are owed, they give you less. And maybe it's not enough or worth enough. How could they just give you less if you have a contract for what it's, it's all, going to If it's all under, on, on cash, how do you trace it? So you're saying people sign, they, they have a handshake and they don't get paid what they do. There's no contracts? When no. I, when, and, and if I'm building a building, I don't get a contract of where, how I'm going to do I, I sign contracts all the time. Right, company. but if you're, you are, you're, you're someone who understands this, you do this very well. But if you are an, a first time undocumented immigrant or even a young kid who doesn't know your rules and, and your rights, right? They just take back money. They just take back the money. They and it's not just money. us making this up. It's statistically proven billions of dollars uh, are stolen every that's year. That's why people join a union, because you're going to protect them. That's why so unions that's, came into existence how much in the first How much place. do you charge? How much do you charge? As I said, it depends on every trade and where about. people are. I can't give you that exact answer. So I'm going to say, but you're going to promise an employee, uh -huh. a, 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 an employee, uh -huh. I guess you call them, yeah. that you're going to stop the wage theft, mm -hmm. but you're charging them a fee to have to for you to govern, for them to be part of the union, for you to govern that they get paid right? Are you talking about member dues? Yeah. Member dues are paid to make sure to, yes, fund the union and make sure Got that it. everybody's uh, uh, rights are protected, Got that it. we have the ability to operate and not just protect what we have, but advance and expand. And when, because when we have more work available to us, mm -hmm. more apprentices can come into our, our, our industry. Yep. And people who join our union, they have that middle-class job. Construction workers in New York, in New York state used to be a guaranteed ticket to the middle-class, right? And not only to, to get there, but stay there. Now, 25% uh, of um, uh, new, uh, construction workers in New York State, they don't have health care. Uh, more than close to 30% um, or have to rely on, uh, uh, on welfare. So we're paying through our taxes because we're not willing upfront to pay our construction workers what they deserve while they risking their lives and limb to build this city. So we make no bones about it that we are aggressive. In making sure how that much those are the workers, membership fees, Kevin? It depends on. It's all depends on how much you're making. I don't know. I don't have that specific answer for you because it depends on each individual member, oh, and, and each individual trade, and how many hours they're working, and all that kind of stuff. A lot of technicalities go into this to make sure it's fair. And so we make no bones about it that we are a strong organization, a well-funded organization, and that's why we are successful in Albany and have been kicking. Uh, 
taking names and, and kicking down doors and, and making sure that the workers are finally being re-represented in the halls of power in New York State. And we're getting results, as I said, with 485X. That proposal on the labor standards, it's what we rewrote. So tell us what that is. Uh, that construction workers in New York City, when they're taking advantage of this 485X program, if it's on a building with more than 150 units, they all earn a fixed rate whether they're in the union industry or the non-union industry. And why is that important? Because now everybody knows the game. Everyone knows what they're entitled to. Uh, everybody knows going in how much this project is going to cost. And it's enough to raise a family in New York City. You see how many people are leaving the city of New York. It's not the rich people. It's actually middle class uh, and, and working class New Yorkers who can't afford to live here anymore. Why? Because income inequality is skyrocketing. Uh, uh, rents, skyrocketing. Home prices, impossible to buy a home. So let's stay the on only, 485. No, I know, so, but this is important. Okay. The only way to fix that is if we make sure that workers are earning enough to live here. We have to also make sure the landlords make a profit, otherwise they won't build buildings. They have nothing to talk about. We have no but, problem with people making profit. We encourage it. We work with developers all well, the time. If, uh, you, you and I both know that if it's, it's going to cost a developer fifty percent more to pay the employees, and they can't charge fifty percent more because the city is going to tell them how much rent they could charge, they're not going to build. I'm glad you brought that up because <sighs> for the past four or five years, right? Or maybe I should say a little less, like two to three years. What? Why have developers not been building? It's not just because there's no 485X. 421A projects still existed. They just weren't being built because they got their foundations in before the program expired. Mm -hmm. So they were allowed to build until, until 2026. But, but there's housing but, court and... Uh, but, but... What was every developer saying in the news? And we have legion of, legions of quotes that it's interest rates that were stopping the construction. So yes, our, is, inf is our labor cost a part of any construction project? Yeah, but so is materials. So is inflation. Everything's so, gone up. Uh, so at the end of the day, game. it's the consumer that's going to pay more. So the workers should suffer? They should, uh, they nobody's should earn Nobody's saying $15? that the workers... I'm just, I'm just giving the facts that right. every, at the end of the day, it's going to be the actual person mm -hmm. who needs the place that's going to pay more. Right. And uh, it's, but, developers are going to have to charge more. And everybody's going to have to. It, it's just prices going but, up. But that's if, simple. But, but if a developer ha earns 12% instead of a 15% project, I'm supposed to cry my eyes because, because of that? Why can't, we why can't we all, as Americans here, and as New Yorkers who believe in the strong economic foundation for this city, ensure that everybody is getting ahead? Why is it a zero-sum game? I, I think game? that this is a, a, a large conversation mm. starting from where you build the building. When you want to build the mm -hmm. building, I think the bottom line is that if I'm going to invest in your building, mm -hmm. I should not be told how much I can rent it for. And I should not be told that if a tenant can't pay rent, that I cannot mm -hmm. evict them. I should not be told that if there's a murderer in my building, mm -hmm. that I can't check their criminal background in order to evict them. These are back, these, these are things that are way out of whack mm -hmm. here. And yes, I, I understand mm -hmm. the employees have to get paid, but we're, this has become a much larger problem. And as a developer, I think that capitalism is being taken away from a developer. And I don't mm. see why a developer would want to build if they can't evict their tenant. The prices yeah. are going to go up and they're, they're, they're capped how much they can charge. Look, I'm not going to take a position on good cause eviction. What I will say is there's if you read the actual statute, there's a whole list of how you can evict your uh, and it takes tenant. two years to get into but, housing but court. I have developers right is, now I work for that literally have mm -hmm. about four to five million in arrears mm -hmm. and they can't get to court for two years. I love that you brought that up for two reasons. One, I think we could both agree housing court needs a ton of judges that they don't have right now because it, it takes too long because of the backlog to get through these cases. The second thing is now that it's in statute, how you can evict all the reasons and how quickly you can evict those tenants, it should be a much easier way to get through the housing system. You can't, there's I'm no- I'm glad we agree on something, yeah, Kevin. <laughs> well, I'm, we're all about agreeing here. And, and so, but, but, you're, but I, we, we at the union, right? We are not ideologues. We endure, we're a bipartisan union and sometimes we get a lot of crap for it. I like conversations mm -hmm. and as long as we're communicating, yeah. this is great. I want to see your point. Mm -hmm. I think you should see my point because uh, yeah. Empire State Properties represents tons of developers mm -hmm. and I see it from their point of view and I think that the most important thing is that what keeps this city together mm -hmm. are real estate taxes. 35% mm -hmm. of the budget of New York comes from taxes and if landlords are mm -hmm. not going to build, you're going to see services decline. And, and but, property taxes are completely out of whack. That's probably what, that's part of the reason we need 
45x in the first place. So tell place. us more about, so you said the first thing is that the wages, uh, the prices are going to go up for the job that they're doing all across the board, whether it's not union prices, or not. Wages, I mean, their wages. wages. Okay. Right. What's and then the, the second thing? thing, as I, I mentioned earlier, if someone commits wage theft, if they steal, uh, if someone on the job, the subcontractor, contractor is committing uh, systemic wage theft where the workers are being exploited, which I think we can all agree is a bad thing, yes. that developer will lose that tax break. So now there is a real uh, punishment in place. How if do you someone, enforce that? Well, if someone commits wage theft, we bring it to the district attorney's office or if we bring it to the um, controller's office. And how do we find it? Yeah. We have a whole organizing department. Part of what member dues go to is hiring organizers who go out to job sites that are non-union, talk to the workers, make sure they know about their rights, make sure they understand That's good. Um, uh, the, the, pro the protocols in place to protect them. Did you know that wage theft, right? If someone stole your wages for $2,000, but it's, in, instead of stealing it out of your pocket, your like your purse... One's a felony and one wasn't. It took until our we got involved last year, we made it so that if someone is stealing $2,000 from you, whether it's your wages or whether it's out of your pocket or another other kind of theft, it's a felony no matter what. So now we are, we are putting in the rules of the road so that it's no longer the wild, wild west out there and every worker, a union or not, is going to have a baseline of protection so that everyone can get ahead. Particularly now when you have so many people that are immigrants and don't speak That's the language, they're going to need this. So I, I, I hear you on that. I'm not going to back mm -hmm. off on the development. They need to keep making money and keep we building. Help them. We want developers. Mm -hmm. We want cities to have a lot of cranes, and mm -hmm. we need that. Let's let's I go back. To, let's go back to Rebney. We know they represent developers. Mm -hmm. I also read that you were disappointed in their last uh, negotiations. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Sure. So I think in, in any given negotiation or conversation like this, you have clear principles, you don't cross, but you got to get to a deal. And there's a way to go about doing it. We, we we have a strategy of being honest brokers. We'll give you data, even if it's not always great for us. Did you say broker? Uh, honest broker, uh, right. Like a uh, honest yeah. stick, you know, in these negotiations. Uh, Rebney had a different um, strategy up in Albany. Um, and that because of that, a lot of the elected officials stopped trusting what they were saying. I think we have to, ba I think we have to dumb it down for sure, my audience. Sure, sure. So first of all, tell us what Rebney is sure. and tell us what the negotiations were about. And then yes. we can go from there. Sure. So uh, we had the, it was the big housing uh, negotiations that occurred last year. It was a landmark deal that came as a result of it. Rebney, from the real estate board of New the, York. They were not happy with that deal. Uh, we think it was a step forward. So Rebney is the real estate board of New York. They represent a lot of developers, if not most of them in the city. Um, they are a very powerful organization that spends a lot of money uh, because they have people, billionaires and millionaires as a part of it. Nothing wrong with that, but they do ha come with a tremendous amount of power. Um, we don't- You're wearing nice shoes and a nice suit, so I know you like some nice things. Yeah, I'm a capitalist. <laughs> okay. I'm a capitalist. Uh, and so, but when that power is unchecked, imbalances occur. Same way going the other way, right? If the left has too much power, that's not good for anybody either, mm -hmm. right? Balance. We're that balance to Rebney. Um, and we started hoping that there would be a good faith exchange of ideas. They decided instead that they can get it done. They thought the what governor- What kind of ideas? Uh, exactly what happened with 45 Yeah, I want to know what happened. The higher, wage, uh, higher wages, right? For our workers, for all workers, not just the members, uh, strong wage enforcement, and that the unit threshold when those wages would kick in would go down from 300 to 150, right? So th those three principles, uh, and we wanted to expand the map when those where those standards would apply. Those four principles form the baseline of our proposal to them. They dismissed it out of hand, gave these silly ideas that include this system called the average wage, which is what had 421A had. And what that is, and I'm going to it's not exactly like this, but I'm going to simplify it so that everybody can understand it, is that every worker on a construction project at the end, all their wages would be added up and then it would have to average out to a specific number. So if it's $50, you're going to have people making $100 and not a lot of it because it's an average, right? It's going to come down. And then a lot of people not making anything at all. And that's wrong. Uh, just be just because you want to have a, and it was vulnerable to massive amounts of fraud. Controller Brad Lander just completed one audit. Uh, that's how complicated this system is. And he found uh, $32 million worth of fraud and wage theft on one project. There are thousands of 421A projects. Can you imagine what's going on in the So you're city? going after all the developers saying that they were taking money from their- from Not their all. 
Not all. So how are you Some. picking and choosing which to audit? Uh, I believe the controller has the ability to audit all of them. We're not doing it. If we do find uh, uh, moments of wage theft, we sh with through our organizing efforts, we do share that with the authorities. Um, and sometimes that instigates a lot of these audits and investigations. Uh, rumor has it that Brad Lander is running for mayor. I guess you're going to endorse him. Uh, we have made no decision on who we're endorsing for mayor. We want to. We want to. Whoever's going to keep this city safe and keep this city affordable. Two really important things to our. I think we both agree to the the lifeblood. No, of the how city. about services? Don't you, don't you want nice trains and safe streets yeah, yeah. and? I think that's all a part of safety and affordability, right? If it if, costs money. It does. We're, we're all about it. The I money didn't realize, comes, the money I didn't realize comes, you were going to support raising taxes. The, co the money comes from the taxes. In order to get mm -hmm. taxes, you have to have tenants and you have to have Agreed. people building. And they're not going to build, so you will not collect any taxes. Look, if, anyway. if we're not building, our members aren't working. That's so, that's point. So it's got to be, so be, be a balance. It's got to be a balance. Let's move on to back to politicians. Mm -hmm. I read that you said that you what you were looking forward to in your current role was holding every politician accountable, no matter who they are. Mm -hmm. When did you say that and what's that about? Uh, I'm not sure exactly when I said it, but that's just the the, the North Star of, of who of how we operate as an organization. Whether you're on the left, whether you're so on you the right. you think they're not accountable now? Uh, on workers' rights. I think there was a lot of people doing important work. We are now in other... Uh, person in that fight and we're very aggressive about it probably the i can most tell aggressive. wow so so <laughs> i need you on this side but, but we do it in a fun way but then so we've we've gone off there for example charles Barron um was very anti-union very anti-development not doing his job for his constituents um he was up for re-election this bright young man uh chris banks who's been a longtime leader in his community stepped forward uh, we supported him. We spent the most out of any union in that race, and he won. So when you don't do the right thing by our members, we're going to come take you out. On the same side, when you do the right thing, we're going to aggressively protect you. Um, that's politics. Uh, and like we make no bones about it. That's, well, I don't <laughs> think it's like the mafia. I think that's just how elections and how they operate. And if you're not willing to actually do that, you are not doing the job for your members. We, are not, we don't get involved in this to be best friends with people. We do it to protect the workers. Can you share with us which politicians you feel are pushing the city forward in a positive way? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, uh, Tish James, uh, Speaker Adams, Speaker Heasty um, are, are doing great things. Um, I th obviously, Hakeem Jeffries. I mean, the fact that we have him in power and, and Chuck Schumer, I think it, we, we cannot underestimate how important that is for New York State's uh, survival. Um, they're all doing extraordinary things. Uh, and then you have like lower level council members, uh, Sandra Ung in, in, in Queens, Linda Lee in the Bronx. You have Kevin Riley, um, who's doing really great things as the zoning chair. So there, there is a breadth of talent that exists in New York City. What do you think about what's happening with, the, with Adams right now? Look, I think anybody's troubled by all these headlines, um, and hopefully we'll get some resolution soon about what's going on. We, we want to have a fully staffed administration. We want to have people doing their best uh, and focused on s delivering for New York City. Um, these are distractions, but you know, hopefully the mayor's going to be able to put them to rest and, and we can proceed forward. Is the Carpenters Union support him? We, we endorsed him last time. We were the only trade to endorse him last time. Do you think you'll endorse him this time? We, our members make those decisions, and we haven't started that process. I understand. Do you know of any negotiations that are now in place with political leaders and labor unions that will be more constructive to help build something? Can you share something on a positive note, something that's going on? Yeah, I think there's, there's two things for that, right? I think first is we actually working with some other uh, labor unions uh, and the Cirrus Fund uh, and recently announced that we've raised or are close to raising, uh, uh, that we are, we've helped fund uh, a plan for $400 million in residential construction for middle, uh, middle class New Yorkers, right? That's a huge amount of money that's going to, and it's going to be built with union wages. So, um, the idea that we can't build with union wages is false. We're doing it. So if we could figure out, I think the, the wizards, uh, at, at Remini can do it too. But we are working like together. <laughs> but I love I love the staff. I'm a member there. of Rebney, so <laughs> uh, look, I, I love the staff there. We get along when we see each other, but we both do our jobs. Got it. Um, uh, so so we are doing that work. We're going to be building uh, housing in New York City, right? You're going to be building housing. Wow. Well, not me personally. I mean, yeah. But uh, the, uh, the but carpenters we, union. But the the well, our pension funds are investing in the fund that will do so. Where? Which locations? Uh, it's in New York City. I can't say just yet. 
we're not we're not there yet. But and it's going to be affordable. It's going to be for the middle class because right, a lot of uh, uh, no wage theft won't be on our sites. Um, and if we do, they'll they'll be quickly thrown out um, and prosecuted uh, because a lot of the housing is going towards low income, right, or high uh, luxury because that's where the subsidies are yep. and that's where the the profit is. We need to protect the middle class. Hey, listen, Kevin, I'm right mm -hmm. with you. You can't have a city without police, without firemen, without truckers, without people that are going to work in the restaurants. And you need mm -hmm. the middle class. There'll be no structure or no city without the proper infrastructure. And I completely about, agree with you. And think about how hard it is to recruit for those jobs right now. It's a, it's a travesty, especially yeah. because you have a lot of those jobs have a New York City requirement. And how about how if they can't afford to live here? And so we're just we're, we're cutting ourselves off at the foot here if we don't. So you're targeting the problem. middle class, not affordability. I think that's what you're going to call it. What do you think? Sometimes call it? that's a that's a false choice. How but are yeah, you going to call it's it? It's going to be more of the middle income band, is my understanding. Like what price? Like what? How much? I'm not sure the exact. Eighty thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, twenty. I think definitely probably a little bit more than eighty thousand. But 80, it, but it, but I, I don't want to say that for sure because let's wait for the projects to be unveiled and all that kind of stuff. But we are investing our money in the future of New York City. We are building New York City with our pension fund and with our blood, sweat, and tears. So we are invested in this. Um, and hopefully, uh, and we're, we're seeing How beyond, many units? Again, that's going to be announced when we have all the projects. I mean, is it 100, 2,000, a million? We got to see. We got to see where. We, there's a lot of fun stuff percolating, but I'm not gonna I'm not going to break news today. Uh, come on, it's the Miller Report. <laughs> I'm sorry. So you, the, your union is doing so well, it's so powerful. How do you see the labor's role growing over the next coming years? Well, look, I, I think we're, we're being aggressive and we're strong and we're powerful. You're very but aggressive. There, but, <laughs> but, there's, but there is uh, a lot more for us to do and grow as a union. So we, we're, we're excited about all those opportunities. But where are we going to fight for more? of our fair share. I mm -hmm. think through all the ULIPs that come through the city council, we want to make sure those workers are protected. So when those negotiations happen, workers are also part of the community negotiations that the community is looked out for. That's always a battle and we, we're, we're fighting and winning those two uh, more often than not. And then on the uh, state side, we want to, there's a law called 224A, which says that when a, a certain amount of public money is put into a private project, there are uh, prevailing wage requirements attached to it. Uh, and so, but there are a lot of loopholes. And so we want to close those loopholes because if our tax money is going to a project, I don't think it's crazy to ask that those workers are not paid below minimum wage or exploited. And so prevailing wage requirements help prevent that. And so we want to make sure that's a part of the discussion in Albany this year too. Okay. Well, this is uh, really interesting, and thanks for helping to rebuild our city, and maybe we can come in the middle. No, I hope we, we have to. We, we have, have to. to. An adversary relationship doesn't help anyone. Yeah, this is a very an interesting podcast, and I think that we're going to get a lot of viewers here. Yeah. So thank you so much, and um, thanks for coming on The Miller Report. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>